we may perceive you, the one who is the living word, the one for whom we live. We ask, we pray, we seek these things in the name of God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, please be seated. I'd like to thank them. Having sung, O come, O come, Emmanuel, Advent can now begin. Friends, good morning. It is good to see uh, those of you who are here. I'm happy that you brave the weather to come. It is good to see you all. Some words from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 36 and verse 44. Jesus said, But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Therefore you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. That meant, friends, as you are aware, is that season within the church's liturgical calendar in which we are invited to reflect on the nature and the extent of our readiness for our Lord's return. But Advent is also that season which, in which we are invited to reflect more generally on that time in which we now live, that is the time between Christ's first appearance among us and the time of His second coming. And how, therefore, our lives reflect the fact that we are indeed a people who are waiting for our Lord's return. So today and for the next three Sundays of Advent, I want to invite you to reflect with me on this very theme, that of waiting for God, waiting for God. Our Gospel passage for today comes near the end of a conversation which Jesus is having with his disciples as they are walking away from the temple in Jerusalem. And the disciples, as we are told, are eager to draw Jesus' attention to the grandeur of the buildings in the temple. And Jesus' response to his disciples is this, he says, Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Words we heard just a few short weeks ago. And as I said then, this was certainly not the response that they were anticipating. But it did invoke among them a discussion about the end of the age and about the signs that would signal for them the end of the age. Now, in its historical context, Jesus' prophecy it anticipated the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, the center of Israelite life and identity, and with it, it signaled the rise, the falls, the messiahs and prophets, the tumult within and among nations, the tumult within and among families, the persecution of the disciples themselves, and the catastrophic occurrences which would take place both on the earth and also in the heavens above. This coming of the Son of Man was a cosmic event that would shape all creation. And yet in the midst of this adversity, in the midst of the uncertainty which Jesus said would come, Jesus was also pointing forward he was also pointing forward to God's promised future, to the anticipated coming of the Son of Man. For His coming would not only signal the end of the age, but His coming would also signal the definitive disclosure, that is, the unveiling of God's judgment, and the fulfillment of the hope for humankind's salvation in true peace and well-being. That is what we hope for. But yet, although the description given here in Matthew's account 
depicts the, this coming as a future event, the whole tenor of the Gospel account. All of the New Testament witnesses, they witnessed Jesus Christ himself as the present embodiment of that divine Son of Man. And so therefore, not only has God's judgment, not only has God's peace already been made known among us in Him, but the coming of man, which Jesus Himself refers to in today's passage, is none but His own return at the end of the age, and at His coming, the definitive fulfillment, the culmination of God's justice, the culmination of God's peace. And for this reason, friends, I believe it is important for us, therefore, to know three important aspects or elements of Jesus' conversation with his disciples in today's passage. First of all, the return of the Son of Man and with him the end of the age and God's final judgment is something that is certain. All right? We can take this to the bank, as they said, for the one who promises, the scripture reminds us, is faithful. God does not lie. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And this is the reason why the season of Advent in which we now live is not just a season in the calendar, but this time in which we now live, this time which the church marks, always serves for us and should serve for us as a wake-up call to recognize where we are in the movement of God in history. The certain future which Christ promised means that no matter how insecure, no matter how secure our present circumstances may seem from our own individual perspectives, things will not continue business as usual. If you're comfortable now, get ready for things are going to get shaken up. If things are shaken up now, fear not. It will not always be that way. God's peace is indeed coming. In fact, things are already coming undone. Let me just think about it for a moment. One day, not even the dead will stay dead. Right? They too will get up and face our Lord's judgment at His return. And this is why, although we live in this world as God's human creatures, as disciples, as children of God, we receive grace to be in this world, but not to be of this world. In terms of adopting this world's ways, in terms of swallowing wholeheartedly this world's values. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. And so our waiting for our coming Lord and King is therefore demonstrated by our faithful and by our obedient service to Him even now while we wait for Him. The example of the saints in whose legacy we continue, they always encourage us to wear this world loosely. Don't hold on to anything too tightly. To not to seek to invest ourselves in it too heavily, too heavily. For to gain it all, we are told, is to forfeit our very soul. This age, friends, is passing away. The second element in Jesus' conversation with his disciples emphasizes the fact that the hour of his return is unknowable. It is unknowable. But being the stubbornly sinful and presumptuous creatures that we are, history is filled with the examples of those who have attempted to read off of history the signs of the ends of the times in order to make incorrect, as they always turn out to be, incorrect predictions about the date of our Lord's return. I'm sure that we can all recall instances where those who have followed such persons, those who have followed such predictions, have often come to great ruin, and some in a catastrophic way. We follow these persons out into a communion, waiting for our Lord to return, selling off all our earthly possessions, and then, of course, the day comes and goes, and things fall apart. 
According to Matthew's account, Jesus makes it clear that about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, Matthew writes. In other words, this is not some predetermined date in human history set by God and by which even God is bound to wait for its arrival before the end may come, right? That will make God a slave to time. But God is not a slave to any creature. But rather, the return of our Lord is a sure and certain promise which is rooted in God's very own being. And as such, it can with certainty be expected to occur. And so just like God's promise to Mary, which preceded the conception and then the birth of our Savior, our Lord's return will only be knowable when that promise is actually fulfilled in the fullness of time. That's when we will know. This coming cannot be read off of history because it does not depend upon the created order. It depends on God and God alone. But unlike the coming of the babe in Bethlehem, to have knowledge of the coming of the Son of Man is at the same time to have knowledge of that inescapable end and judgment of all things. In other words, they only recognize God's promise in Jesus when they saw him. We will only recognize God's coming and his return when we stand before his day. And so this leads, therefore, to the third and final element of Jesus' conversation with his disciples, which is his crucial admonition to them to be ready and watchful, to remain ready and watchful. He says, therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. But what does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be watchful? Does it mean that we're sitting at our doors and looking up at the sky, maybe consulting with our fortune teller or looking in the crystal ball trying to figure it out? Let me suggest, friends, that our, our readiness here does not mean trying to hedge one's bets, waiting until the very last moment in order to commit to Christ. Well, I think you may be coming around this time, so I'll just wait, live my life how I want to, and then at the last minute, I will slide into home base. And similarly, watchfulness, friends, does not mean trying to read the signs of the end times so that we know when to cut and run. But rather, Jesus' example from the day's passage, right? And that's where these things are linked. His example of Noah and his example of the household suggests that readiness and watchfulness that they are a particular way of life in this world. It is a hopeful response of repentance and obedience, which is our only fitting and appropriate response to the sure and certain promises of God. In obedient response to the promise of God, Noah, with the help of God, he built an ark in the middle of the wilderness. I mean, think about that for a moment. He built an ark in the midst of the wilderness, dry land. I can only imagine what his contemporaries might have been saying there. There goes eccentric old Noah again. But he built this ark in the middle of the wilderness, striking purposive blows with his tools, many of which probably went unnoticed amidst the ridicule of his contemporaries. Indeed, Jesus reminds us that they were consumed with life's activities. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So the sure and certain promise of God's forgiveness has already come to us in this Jesus Christ who is our God. And so with him as our foundation, 
God is building us like living stones into a spiritual house in the midst of this wilderness world. I'll say that again. God is building us just like that ark in the midst of this wilderness world. And as we turn to him in repentance, as we take up our cross and we follow him, truly loving him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, loving our neighbors as we ourselves have been loved by God. Every time we do that, when we live in this way, God is striking purposive blows through our lives, which for the moment may go unnoticed here on earth. What are those Christians doing over there? What is God building them into? When they gather week by week, what is God doing in their lives? The dynamics of our living in this world and in this age which is passing away are therefore very similar to that of the household in Jesus' example. Had the householder known it would part of the night the house would be broken into, he would not have let it happen. He would have stayed away. And as Christians, we do not know, we cannot know, the hour of our Lord's return. And so readiness and watchfulness must be our way of life, our repentant way of life. It is depicted in today's passage from Romans. Paul speaks about laying aside the works of darkness, putting on the armor of light putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, making no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's how we prepare even now. You see, you and I, we live in the midst of a world where many have turned to other powers rather than God in the hopes of finding their way. We live in a world where many people live Adulterous, not just in a spiritual sense, but in terms of their relationships with one another. We live in a world where persons are prepared to sacrifice things like honesty, things like integrity, all for personal gain. Where transparency is more an illusion than reality. And many are not even concerned anymore that. People can't be taken at their word. <coughs> Remember a time when your word was your bond. If you said something, you could take that to the bank. But it is not so today, and many seem not even to care. Fake news reigns <coughs> We live in a world where hired workers are routinely oppressed in their wages. Whether the young, the elderly, the vulnerable, it doesn't matter. They are routinely exploited. The alien, the immigrant, they are brushed aside as if they do not matter. All as a matter of prudent social or cultural or economic policy. So we live in a world where much which often passes for peace is more often than not a very thinly veiled violence and war. You just go below what looks like a peaceful circumstance and you see all the fighting that's really going on. In short, friends, we live in a world which has grown impatient, a world which has forgotten what it means to wait for God, to wait in God, to wait with God, to wait through God by our faithful and obedient service to Him. So friends, as those who live now in the sure and certain hope of our Lord's return, let us find encouragement in the faithfulness and the trustworthy promises of our God and of His return. Let us learn what it means even now to wait for Him by the grace that He gives that we may live lives of faithful and obedient service to Him all the days of our life. That's how we keep oil in the lamp. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. That we are not found without oil. 
but that we are found living faithful lives day by day and moment by moment, so that when our Lord comes and opens the door, we may go in. Friends, let that be our Advent prayer this 